glorious Lord, glorious King, the heavens declare your fame. Beautiful Jesus, my heart will sing.
worship you. devoted time with him this morning amen let's pray father we thank you for the privilege to come together as a body of christ thank you father for those that are here those that are listening by live stream we believe today that your word has free course we thank you for that today we thank you for every family here every family represented and we know that they'll be different because of the word today we believe we receive that in jesus name amen Be seated. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Y'all saw I'm I got happy to out. be here today. She, she straightened me out and they started the clock right now. So if you Praise weren't here God. in the first service, you don't understand all that. <laughs> Man, pastor's excited this morning. I hope you brought your seat belts and your helmets. Seriously, you know, that's one of the things I most admire about my pastor, my shepherd, my husband, is that he's still teachable. I'm afraid he would be unbearable if he ever came to the day that he wasn't teachable. But, you know, he's, uh, he's on fire, I'm just telling you. This is a new season of the earth. This is a new era in your lives. Receive that. Don't keep doing things the same old way. This is a time that God's doing a new thing. If you've never called on the Holy Spirit frequently before, do it now. Ask for wisdom for every decision you make. Follow after the Holy Spirit. He will lead you and guide you into this new season. And you will, you know, this world, you're never supposed to feel totally comfortable in this world. But in God's system, you can fit. You can feel comfortable in God's system despite what's going on around you. Amen. Uh, the Lord is so good. And I'm so happy y'all are here. Do we have visitors this morning? Anybody new faces in here? Good morning. Thanks for coming. Thank y'all. Others, anybody else that I missed? Well, thank y'all so much for coming. We love it here. It's called Abiding Love. We, I call it Love Church because this is the church where love abides. Amen. And, and it, that's, the Bible's all about that. So quickly, I'm all, um, I wanted to share with you this morning. I was reading, uh, if you were to put all the Greek translation words in with the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, this is how it would read. Love patiently and passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed. Love doesn't demand others to be like itself. Rather, it is so focused on the needs of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. Keep disappearing it. Love is not ambitious, self-centered, or so consumed with itself that it never thinks of the needs of, or desires of that others possess. Love doesn't go around talking about itself all the time, constantly exaggerating and embellishing the facts to make it look more important in the sight of others. Love does not behave in a prideful, arrogant, haughty, superior, snooty, snobbish, or clannish manner. Love is not rude and discourteous. It is not careless or thoughtless. It does not carry on in a fashion that would be considered insensitive to others. Love does not manipulate situations or scheme and devise methods that will twist situations to its own advantage. Love does not deliberately engage in actions or speak words that are so sharp they cause an ugly or violent response. Love, love does not deliberately keep records of wrongs or past mistakes. Love does not feel overjoyed when it sees an injustice done to someone else, but is elated and ecstatic and overjoyed with the truth. Love protects, shields, guards, covers, conceals, and safeguards people from exposure. Remember that old Bible verse, love covers? Love strains forward with all its might to believe the very best in every situation. You know, if you find yourself in questionable situations, choose to believe the best. Love always expects and anticipates the best in others and, and the best for others. Love never quits, 
never surrenders and never gives up. I saw a t-shirt yesterday. It says, you may see me struggle, but you'll never see me quit. <laughs> Love never disappoints, never fails, and never lets any, anyone down. That's the God kind of love. And I just wanted to give you something to chew on today. I really hope in the next few weeks, in, in just the couple of minutes I have at the beginning of each service, to focus on families, marriages, couples, and give you all some homework. So I would love for you to go home and write on a little index card the love chapter in whichever translation you like best and chew on it every day, read it every day, and find some aspect of it that you ask the Holy Spirit and the Lord to work on you with. I'm a long way from getting all this right, but I'm working on something of it all the time. Amen? And, and uh, I know we have some special birthdays today. I know we don't usually do this, but <laughs> I know Mr. Johnson, he's, he's like um, a special birthday today, a, a three-quarters of a century. <laughs> And Mr. Albert has a birthday today. I just want to say, bless y'all for being in the Lord's house on your birthday. And I pray you can get celebrated in a special way. Hallelujah. Thank y'all for coming today. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you going to help me do this? Okay. You see that time? You didn't pay no attention. Countdown. Ten, nine, eight. <laughs> Let's all stand up. <laughs> Praise God. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am who it says I, I am. am. Who it says I, I am. have, I have what, it says I what it says I have. I can do, I can do what it says I can do. Says I can Today, do. Today, my mind, my mind is, alert. is alert. My spirit, my spirit is, receptive. is receptive. Today, Today I, will I will receive, receive the incorruptible, incorruptible indestructible, indestructible Word of God. God. Today, Today, I will be forever changed and challenged in Jesus' name. name. Believe it. Give him a shout. Woo, praise God. Man, I'm excited about the Word. How many of y'all excited about the Word? Praise God. And so if you'll turn in, my, in your Bibles uh, this morning uh, to Mark chapter 4, uh, I told the first service the last time I endeavored to teach uh, Mark chapter 4, it took me about five years. You say, well, why would it take you so long to teach that? Uh, so I want us to look, before we read the first few verses, I want us to look at verse 13, and I believe verse 13 will explain the importance of this message. Uh, this message is the most important message in the whole Bible, because Jesus said, if you don't understand this message, you'll be lost in anything else I try to teach you. You say, well, why would Jesus say that? Because God has a premier law in this earth, and it's called seed and harvest. And he does everything based on seed and harvest. And his word, Jesus went in depth, teaching that his word is a seed. That Jesus is the seed. Jesus is the word. And the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And we beheld the glory and the grace of God's word. And so Jesus is endeavoring uh, to teach. And he's going to teach people and then he breaks this down even in an in-depth teaching more than he did uh, to his disciples. And here's what he said in Mark chapter 4, verse 13, the Amplified Bible. says, and he said to them, do you not discern and understand this parable? How then is it possible for you to discern and understand all the parables? That would be pretty important, wouldn't it? If Jesus is the Word, and He became flesh, and out of everything He said on earth, He said, if you don't understand this, you will not understand anything else I say. Why? Because this is a premier law of God. Even in Psalms 138, God said, I've exalted my Word above my name. The importance of the Word of God. And being a stickler for the Word of God. Now, it says that Satan hates the Word more than anything. Why would he hate the Word more than anything? Because in Genesis chapter 1, without the Word, everything remained void and empty. But as soon as the Word was spoken, life began in the seed. And God said, let there be. And in everything God created... He put seed, and he put power in that seed, 
once acted upon to produce exactly what he said. And then in the New Testament, it said that word came into a void and an empty place in humanity without, a, without relationship and fellowship with God. And he said when that word came, that word filled a void and it brought life. And in 2016, that seed and that word remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's word never changes. It will never cease to exist. It's the power of his word that holds everything in its place. And the word of God affects everything. And it controls everything. And if you and I learn to act on the word, there's not any situation that we cannot rule and reign in in this life. Wow. When you're talking about the word of God. And so we're going to read a, a few verses here. And, uh, and then we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to review a little bit. And then we're going to get a little bit deeper into this. But I can tell you I'm not in a hurry. I say I'm not in a hurry. Why? Because this is the most important teaching that Jesus ever gave. He said again. Verse 1, Jesus began to teach beside the lake, and a very great crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a ship and set in order to set in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was at the lake shore, lakeside on the shore. Now, we said this last week, Jesus knew, number one, that he couldn't do the will of God sitting on the beach. In other words, he had to launch out into the deep. He had to get out. And once he got out into a place of faith, of position himself, then his voice became very powerful. It carried on the water. Today, in 2016, as we launch ourselves out into the deep, into places of faith with God, then our voice carries on the move of God. And that voice not only affects us, it affects everybody that hears it. Why? Because the Word of God has that kind of power. The word has that kind of power that it changes people's lives and it changes situations and it changes circumstances. And so he, the next thing he said, and he taught them many things in parables, illustrations, or comparisons, but besides truths to explain them, and in his teaching he said to them, give attention. Somebody say give attention. To this, behold, the sower went out to sow. Now I want to say a couple of things here. Number one, he said to pay attention. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But he said the sower went out to sow. Now I want you to notice, however long it takes us to go through the book of the, this chapter of Mark, I want you to understand it only talks about the sower one time. So I remember one time I was preaching on faith and prosperity, and faith, the faith message on health and wealth and prosperity, and I had a lady come up to me and she challenged me on that message. And she said to me, she said, you will be responsible for the scripture that you preach. I said, and according to Mark chapter 4, you'll be four times as responsible. I understand my responsibility this morning as a broadcaster or a sower of the word. But I want you to understand how you receive this word is going to determine the rest of your life. And where you end up in your life. How you prosper in your life. How your marriage operates. How your children grow up. How everything happens in life depends on you and my ability to understand the power of God's word. That's why we said last week that uh, Solomon, the wisest and the wealthiest person, the way he became that was he paid attention to what his dad told him. Proverbs chapter 4, he said, my son, pay attention. You hear people say this all the time. I'm so broke I can't pay attention. It's the reason they are broke is because they did not pay attention. They did not hear the voice and the word of the Lord when it was spoken to them. Because God's word will bring you to a place of health and prosperity. And whatever, and I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about your marriage. I'm talking about your body. We're going to see in a minute where this word affects, I said it affects everything. It don't just affect one area. The word of God is a seed. And when that seed is sown in any area, it has power to produce. So he said to pay attention. So he told, he told Solomon, David told him, he said, number one, pay attention to what I'm saying. The next thing he said is consent. What does consent mean? Shut up and don't argue. Don't argue. Then he said submit. What does submit mean? That means when I leave, I ain't going to talk no different. 
He said, number one, son, if you want to be successful in life and you want to be healthy, you want to be wealthy, and you want to be wise, you've asked God for wisdom. Wisdom is seed and harvest. It's what you sow is what you're going to reap. In Galatians chapter 6 is called the law of sowing and reaping that goes right along with the law of seed and harvest. Whatever seed you sow, you will reap. So these are two premier laws of God. And it's amazing. They are. Somebody say, they are laws of God. What does that mean? They work for anybody. You don't have to be born again for this to work. This works for everybody. What a person sows, they reap. It's on the good and the bad. You take a company that I wouldn't say was real righteous, it's Budweiser. But they know they've learned how to work this system of God. They make a lot of money, but they give a lot of money. So that system works for them. Isn't that amazing? It works for them. Just like gravity works for you, whether you're born again or not born again, it's a law that God put in the earth, and it works for everybody. The law I'm talking about, it works for everybody in the earth. It don't just work for me because I'm born again. He said it rains on the just and the unjust. In other words, these laws work for all of us, but we want to work these laws where we're blessed and we don't have a bunch of sorrow and stuff with it. So we learn to work the word, the law of God, by the word of God. Because you're going to live by your word. Your words are going to frame your world. What you've been saying for the last 10 years. I hear people say this. I hear couples get mad and say, I'm getting a divorce. I'm get-. You know what? Write it down. Write it. It's coming. If you write it down, you are talking self-fulfilling prophecy. You're go- and then you're going to wonder who did it. Well, you did it. You spoke it into existence. What was not there, you spoke it. Come on, I've heard people say stuff about their family having a, a, a generational curse of cancer or diabetes or whatever it is. And, and I'll, I'll hear, I've heard them say, well, you know, I know about 50. Daddy got that or Mama got that. You know, it runs in our family. Every woman in our family has had breast cancer. So, you know, I, I know there's going to... They, they're fulfilling things. They put a law into... They put that law... They have put that law, and and nothing can stop it because it's a law. So you don't want to say that. What you want to say is what God says. By Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Whatever's been a curse in my family, it's going to be broken off. Or you could say it this way. In the last six or eight weeks, this has gotten so in my spirit. Never before. Somebody say never before. And I mean, mean, I've, I've been practicing it. And it's fun. You know why? Because it works. So it was 12.33 Saturday morning. I woke up. I couldn't breathe out the left side of my nose. I mean, I just, I said, oh, no. I said, no, you're a liar. I said, number one, sin does not have dominion over me. Satan, you don't have dominion over me. And the system of this world does not have dominion over me. For sin... I have redemption. For Satan, I have a redeemer. For this system, I have righteousness. You know, in about 15 minutes later, I was breathing just like I am right now. I said, ooh, devil. If it'll work on a stopped up nose, it'll work on cancer. It'll work on, why? It's a law of God. I said, it'll work on what you're working on. You better put a guard Come on, pay attention to what you're saying. Come on, because you're consenting and submitting to it. So it might as well be what God said. But Jesus said, the sower sows the word. So you are sowing the word. And you will reap, and I will reap. And I want you reaping good. I said, I want you reaping good. I want you the most healthy and wealthy people in this county. Come on, I want you to be the greatest testimony of anybody in this county. Woo! Somebody say, and the word of God, the power of God, flows best where there's least resistance. In other words, that when you see anything in the natural that we've learned to harness, we learn to harness electricity. And when we learn to harness electricity, we control that by what, the conduit of that is or the resistance of that. Uh, even to the point, if you get in your car, when you leave here, you have a thing we call the volume button. Do you know what the volume button does? It's called a rheostat. It is a resistor. That's all it is. And you control it. 
It's no different when it comes to the power of God. He said, I will withhold no good thing. So God, there, it, it, here's what James said. He said, there is no variableness. There is no shadow of turning in him. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness and there is no shadow of turning. In other words, there is no darkness in this. In other words, God said, though, the button is wide open. So you control that, that voice. You control how loud that speaks and you control how loud other sounds speak. Here's what Jesus said, Mark chapter 4, around verse 18 or so. He said, be careful what you hear. Say why? Because we're talking about the law of resistance now. That limits the law of the power of God and the anointing of God in your life. He said the first thing it affects, he says, is what you hear, you hear ears. He said, Jesus talked about these gates all through his teaching. He talked about the ear gate, the eye gate, and the mouth gate continually. He said, and those gates determine your life. He said, be careful what you hear. Then he said, be careful how much measure or how much meditation you give to what you hear. What's he telling you? Somebody say, protect your ear gate. Say, why? Because either doubt, fear, unbelief, anxiety, worry, or calmness, comfort, assurance, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken, the peace of God. He said, the next thing he said was, be careful what you see. What you see, what you allow your meditation. He said, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. What's he talking about? He said, they don't see like I see, and they don't hear like I see. Or, or see like I see, or hear like I, I hear. And so, when I preach this, I always think about when our kids were small, they had those C and C's, and back then, you pulled the string. Any of y'all remember those? That old, you remember the C and C's? And so the C and C had a, a voice box, which was the heart of the whole machine. Because if the voice box didn't work, it didn't matter what it spun to. So there's no identification, so it doesn't matter. So in your life, your voice box is your heart, where your spirit man and your soul, your mind, will and emotion live. And, and it, it looks out, and when it sees something, it says, this is what I see. So this is what I say. I heard that. Come on, because if you got one of them boxes, you got one of those little see and say things, and, and when you pull it, it goes to a dog, but it says it's a cat, and it meows, you're going to have a confused kid at seven. <laughs> Not only that, you're going to have a hard time teaching that child. For seven years, they've heard a voice and they saw a picture that says this cat is a dog, this dog is a cat, and it's ingrained in an in a avenue of their soul, in their mind, will, and emotion, that literally a new rut, that rut has to leave, and a new rut has to come in that says, the true voice says, this is the cat, this is the dog. The same thing happens to us in life. That's why Jesus said, be careful, guard these gates. That's why David said, guard your soul, guard your mind, will, and emotion. How do I do that? Guard what I hear. Guard what I see, because out of that, out of the abundance of my voice, my heart, the flow, the issues of life. So what's might about the word having free course? Some word's going to have free. So you might as well allow the word of God to have free course. See what God sees. Say what God says. God said, your, somebody say, God's word in my mouth is as powerful as is God's word in his own mouth. Why? Because Jeremiah one twelve, he said, I hasten and watch over my word to perform it. Paul said this way, he said, quit arguing, I planted, Apollos watered, but God brings the increase. What's he talking about? It's about the word of God. Bring an increase and multiply. Isaiah 55 says, as sure as the snow. And the rain comes down from heaven looking for a place to land to give water to the seed of the earth. He said, so, come on, my word comes out of heaven looking for soil to go into to produce a harvest. 
Now we're talking about, when we're talking about this morning, we're talking about the most serious thing you'll ever talk about, and this is really Jesus, or this is the Word, and what the Word does when it became flesh, and what the Word should do in you, even though you are flesh. Somebody say the eye gate. <laughs> the center of my heart. Come on, now let's look over. Let's look at Mark, let's look at Hebrews chapter 4 real quick. Man, I, there ain't no way I'm 24 minutes into this thing. I've not been preaching 24 minutes. I think they got that clock. Pastor Allen got that clock where it's fast or something. He speeds it up. If he likes what I'm preaching, he slows it down. If I'm bothering him, he speeds it up. Speed it up. Speed it up. I don't like that message. It's bothering me. He's talking about, he talking about well, husband, love your wife like Christ loved the church. He said, I want to crucify her like the world crucified him. <laughs> Come on, you're talking about submitting in the Word. Here's what the Word says about that. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. But it says also for husbands to love their wives like Christ loved the church. In the very next verse, nobody likes to quote this one. It says, and submit one to another. Now, what, what does that mean? That means there are areas in our life and in our marriage that she's a lot better than I am. What does that mean? That means I need to pay attention to her consent to her and submit no matter how how painful the crucifixion is <laughs> come on and, and that's what that means and that's what Solomon David is trying to tell Solomon he said when it comes to the word if she's speaking the word it don't matter whether you like it or not it's the word and you don't need to be arguing with it you need to shut up consent and then submit. That means when I leave, I'm not going to say, I ain't, I'm going to do whatever crap I want to do now. She ain't here. You might think that, but you're going to get caught. And it's going to be ugly. It will be heaven to pay. All right. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word that God speaks. Somebody say, the word that I speak. Why? Because I'm going to speak God's word. Now, what happens whenever you speak God's word? For the word God speaks is alive. You know, you can tell when people are speaking God's word. It, it ain't hard to tell. I said, what do you mean? Is it patient? Is it kind? Is it long-suffering? Is it touchy? Is it fretful? Is it resentful? Is it self-seeking? Is it insisting its own rights in its own way? Because God, now God is love. Come on, does it have joy in it? Does it have peace in it? Does it have long suffering in it? Is it patient? Is it temperate? Self control? Is it mixed with the love of God? Or is it just explosive? For the word God speaks. Of course, he's saying, so if I'm going to speak God's word, then I can tell if you're speaking God's word. In other words, I know the voice of my shepherd if it's coming out of Mitchell. I can tell if it's the voice of God. Because if it's the voice of God, it'll have that ingredient. If it don't have the voice of God, he can say, the Lord told me. And I'll say, don't sound like the voice of the Lord. You say, well, it's hard to hear the voice of the Lord. It ain't hard to hear the voice of the Lord. It sounds just like that does. You ever listen to yourself? You sound just like you sound. God sounds exactly like he sounds. So it's not real hard to figure out because if it's the word of God, number one, it's alive or it's producing life, it's not producing death. It's producing peace, it's not producing division. Come on, we're talking about speaking the word. Come on, why? Psalms 133 says, where there's unity, I command the... Who wants unity? Well, who wants to be blessed? Come on. In, that, in other words, if I, if I promote unity, then you can't stop the blessing. You do whatever you want, but you can't stop the blessing. Why? Because I'm acting on the word, and it's alive, and it's, look what's the next thing it says it is. The word of God is what? Full of what? Power. What, making it active, operating, energizing, effective. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, penetrating the dividing of the breath of the life on the soul and the immortal spirit the joints and the marrow of the deepest parts of the nature, exposing, sifting, and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Somebody say, the Word of God touches everything. He said, the Word of God affects my spirit. 
It affects my soul, my mind, will, and emotion. The Word of God affects my thought life, and the Word of God affects my body. Come on, so if I'm having a problem in any of those areas, it ain't far to find out where the problem is. Say, it's right under my nose. That's where the problem is. So where's the problem? It ain't long distance, Homer. You don't have what somebody else says. You have what you say. You don't have what I say. You don't have what God says. You got to say what God says. So I just got what God says. No, you don't have what God says unless you sow that seed. In other words, you got to say what God says. And if you and I will say what God says, that's why Jesus said, this is the most important thing I'll ever teach you. That's why it's the most important. And people hate to hear this sometimes. They say, I don't want to hear that. Well, if you don't want to hear this, nothing else is going to work for you. You ain't going to have no healing, no deliverance, no safety, no perseverance. You're going to go to heaven, but you're going to feel like and look like hell when you get there. Thank God for a new body and a makeover. I love those shows. Makeover. I, I say, I've got a few people I'd like to send. Come on, God said you ain't even getting heaven without a makeover. He said you are not getting in here with that attitude or looking like that. He said, I got a new body for you. I think that's why he don't look at you. He said, I can't even look at that. You ever see people when they pray sometimes? You should see people's faces. God, I need help. And God's going, man. Ooh. Well, you look like the fallen Adam right now. You don't look nothing like me. How'd you like people to talk to you like that? I need help. And then you like, I helped you. Get out of here. Come on, you know, you know what you look like when you cry. You know, they always told us men don't cry. You ever grow up, men don't cry? That's a lie. Jesus wept. I remember Pastor Mark said, if I ever asked you to preach and you get up and say, Jesus wept, and that's all you say, you better hope everybody starts crying right real quick. <laughs> you quote the scripture. I quote the scripture real quick. Jesus wept. Let me go sit down. Come on, you, you know, you've been in trouble and you run in there in the, in the bathroom and look in the mirror and see what you look like. You ever look? Don't act like you ain't never done. Everybody in here has done that at least once. Matter of fact, some of y'all look like that right now. Oh, man. Look at this. Look at verse 13. And not a creature exists that is, not, that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open, exposed, naked, and defenseless to the eye of him with whom he has to do. Somebody say, nothing is a secret to the Word of God. Now, that's good because it says the Word of God, uh, you know, I don't have a problem with counseling. I don't have a problem with any that kind of stuff. I believe there's times that people need to be counseled to get things that help get things out of them. But if you're getting counseled 20 years later on the same thing, <laughs> there's a problem. There's a serious problem because that wound is still open. It is never going to have a chance to heal. Just like when a surgeon goes in and they operate, they take out and then they close it up. If they have to reopen it, it's not good. It's not good. Nothing wrong with let's get this thing cleaned out, let's get it out of us. But every time you talk about that, every time you rehearse that, you cut that wound back open and you expose it to whatever elements in this world there are. And the devil jump on those elements. There has to be a time where you allow that to close. Somebody say closure. And let it heal. And if you allow it to let it heal, they'll be, listen, I've got scars where I got cut and stuff when I was little. You can't even see the scar hardly anymore. Not because they're all covered up with fat either or wrinkles. They just faded. Like, be nice to some people. We went and saw that movie, Peach Dragon. Y'all see Peach Dragon yet? Y'all need to see Peach Dragon. We took Spud to see Peach Dragon. Isn't that what it is, Peach Dragon? It was great. This big old dragon, and he could disappear. He could hide himself. He ain't freaking folks out. And then if somebody really up, made him upset, he didn't try to kill him. He just sneezed all over. It was wonderful. Just dragon snot everywhere. And I was like, man. Me and Spud, we was loving it. I said, you see that? He goes, ew. I said, isn't that awesome? He just sneezed snot all over that guy. Pops, can we do that? I said, that's not a good idea. GTA, get on us. I said, if it's just me and you, it'd be great. So I say, nothing. Nothing is a secret to God. When the word hits, the word goes, but it doesn't go to do damage. It goes to cut and remove 
and allow healing and health to come. That's what the Word of God does, and it's active, and it has that kind of power to heal anything that's ever happened to you. It can work in you. The Word of God can work if you'll work the Word. Let's look back at Mark chapter 4 real quick. i got to close right here. Well, let me give you this. We're just kind of in the review in most of this. We talked some uh, last week about, remember, about taking the path, taking the path, staying focused, to keep your focus, Mark chapter 4, I mean, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, he said, God, uh, Solomon told, or David told Solomon, keep your focus. Keep your, how many know it's hard to keep your focus? And we talked about when you get snake bitten and things happen in life. You know, here you got Paul, he's on a, he's on a, he's on a ship. Uh, on the third day of a 14-day storm, Paul tells everybody to be happy. I mean, you know, it ain't easy to be happy when you're in the middle of a storm. And, and not only are you in the middle of a storm, you're throwing all your stuff off the boat. You're losing everything you've, you've worked all your life for. It, it's going away. And then not only that, then the boat comes apart. And, and Paul's on the boat floating going, ha, 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 ha. That's what the word, the word gave him that kind of confidence. And then when he got on the island, when he got on the island, he got snake bit by a viper. And everybody looked at him and thought he should be dying. And he just shook it off. And revival hit the island. What does that mean? That means there's going to be difficult and challenging times in your life. But if God told you to go to Rome, you're going to Rome. Don't worry about what happens on the way. You're going to get there. If that ship falls apart, he got another ship. Come on, if you get snake bit, you'll, come on, you're going to live through it. Other people think it's over, but it ain't over because there's another ship. And there's something that will neutralize the snake bite. We talked about that in Numbers last week, about being able to keep your focus and your gaze on God in the middle of these attacks. The only way you do that is you stay rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Say why? You have to take your place in Christ. You've got to find that place of faith. And you'll find that place of faith. God made that place of faith years before you ever got there. Pastor Allen used this a few weeks ago to take up an offering. And the Holy Spirit just began to deal with me about it, about Zacchaeus. And how that Zacchaeus was one of the most wicked people in that city. He was a thief. He, 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 he was a thief. He was a liar. He was a cheat. But God built a place of, 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 of an encounter with Christ. A tree that God built years before Zacchaeus ever got there. But Zacchaeus found that place of faith. When he got to that place of faith, he took that place in that tree in Christ. When he positioned himself where he was supposed to be then the power of God hit Zacchaeus' life. He encountered the word of God in the flesh. He encountered the love of God in the flesh before the blood of Jesus was ever shed. It affected Zacchaeus to the point that Zacchaeus said, I've never been loved and accepted. This is amazing. You're not talking about my past. You're not talking about who I, hit, who I took from, who I cheated from. You're just, there's just some kind of, uh, of, a, uh, there's some kind of substance coming out of you that's changing the atmosphere of my home. It's changing the atmosphere of my heart. It's changing the atmosphere of the way I think. To the point, he said, I'm going to give, this is extravagant. I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor. That's an encounter, baby. I don't care if you've got five dollars or five millions. If you're talking about giving away half to somebody, that's, that's extravagant. That's huge. If you don't think it's huge, why don't you try it this morning? Just give away half of what you got. And then he said, not only will I give away half of what I have, anybody I've taken anything unlawfully, wrongfully from, I will restore to them four times what I took. That's extravagant, church. That's the Word of God in the flesh. That, that's an encounter in Christ. That's the way when people encounter you, this is the kind of encounter they should be having. And then he said this. He said, Jesus said, salvation or deliverance or change has come to your in -house, entire household. So now let's put that in order. Zacchaeus met Christ. He encountered the Word. He encountered this God kind of love. When he did that, it changed everything about Zacchaeus. It changed his family. Not only did it change his family, it changed his community. Not just because he gave half to the poor, but who gave half to the poor? And then he was restoring people. You're talking about extravagance. You're talking about this one, this word. That's why Jesus said, this is the most important thing I'll ever tell you. If this word is working mightily in you, it won't just affect you, sir, ma'am. It'll affect your spouse, it'll affect your kids, it'll affect your household, it'll affect your community, it'll affect everything about you. It don't just touch one place, the Word touches every place. 
The word cannot just touch one place in your life. It must touch every part of your being. Your spirit, your soul, come on, your mind, will, and emotion. It must, come on. Your body, your checkbook, your community, everybody you encounter, this word encounters them. He said, and the word became flesh, and we beheld the word. We stopped, looked, and listened. And it was full of grace, and it was full of truth. Woo, and what we're going to talk about further in here is this grace that God gives us is the seed of Christ. But that grace cannot be tapped into without faith. And faith is a seed. And Jesus talks about how the word is a seed and how the word develops in your life and in my life so that we can live a life like this. Somebody say, take your place, take your position, and the power of God will flow through my life. Proverbs chapter 3 said, don't lean to your own understanding. He said, acknowledge me all your ways and I will direct your path. Ephesians 2.10 says, You're the workmanship of God, recreated in Christ under good works that he before ordained that you should, you, you should walk in them, taking the good paths that he prearranged. Psalms chapter 23 says, The Lord is your shepherd. He's got paths of righteousness for you. So what are you saying? I'm saying the words already went before you. God's got divine appointments and kingdom connections for you to affect his kingdom. Not only will this affect my life, and my family, but I want it to affect you. I want it to affect the community. Come on, I'm telling you that I don't believe the church, and I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about the church as a whole, understands the kingdom of God, that understands that, that Jesus is not church-minded, he's kingdom-minded. He was drawn to John the Baptist because John the Baptist was kingdom-minded. He said, the kingdom's on the way. And Jesus said, the kingdom's among you. He said, there's coming a day this kingdom will move inside of you. And he said, Mark chapter 4, he said, and this is how the kingdom operates. So if I want this kingdom to work in my life, I better understand Mark chapter 4. He said, because this is the number one key to kingdom living. Not religious living, kingdom living. What does that mean? Walking in the din dominion, power, and authority of the DNA that's on the inside of you being established God's dominion he said I've been given all power in heaven and in earth he said and now I gave it to you so how does it work it works through the word it works through the word that's why Satan hates people that preach the word he don't care about churches that are church minded that are concerned just about their little four walls and growing their ministry he's concerned about people that are about kingdom business Let's grow the kingdom. And in the kingdom, you'll grow. You'll grow. I'll grow. And the kingdom will be established in the earth. I'm telling you, God's up to some good stuff. Somebody say, sin, Satan, and this system will never rule over my life ever again. I will take my dominion, my power, my authority. I'll walk. In the DNA of Jesus Christ, I'll allow his word to have free course. I will not put up a law and a wall of resistance. What does that mean? I'm going to hear the word, pay attention. I'm going to consent. And if it's the word, whether I like it or don't like it, I'm going to submit to it. So, yep, that's the word. So, I'm going I'm to I'm submit to the word, and the word will work mightily on the inside of you. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you this morning. For the word, the name, and the blood. For your goodness, your grace, your faithfulness today. Thank you that the word became flesh. And we saw exactly how it operates in the earth. Now, Father, allow that same word to operate through us in the earth. That your kingdom would be established in and through us, Father. We thank you for that today. This morning with every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around. Maybe you're in this room. Maybe you're listening by live stream. Maybe you're listening later and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. This is the most important decision you'll ever make. You say, why is that? Because the seed of Jesus Christ will come and live on the inside of you. And the whole potential of everything he is, was, and ever will be will be available at you and in you and through you, through your faith in the grace of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. If that's you today, I'm just going to ask you. We're all going to pray a prayer in here. If you're in his place this morning, pray it.
if you're listening, you pray. Let's all say this together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the blood of Jesus that washes me, cleanses me, and makes me whole. I believe in my heart. And I say it with my mouth. I'm blood washed. I'm blood bought. I'm redeemed and a child of the King. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good this morning? Amen. amen. That was an awesome, awesome word this morning. Thank all of you for, uh, first of all, for being here, being in the house of the Lord. You know, uh, I was talking about Wednesday night about first and how important the word first and everything first is to God. And, uh, you know, I, so I want to expound on that a little bit. But, you know, this is where you start your week. Some people think Mondays is the start of the week. Monday is not the start of the week. It may be the start of your work week, but Sunday is the start of your week. And when God says, I, he says, I want you to put me first, that's why you're here this morning. You and I are putting God first this morning by giving our time to God and being in his house this morning. Uh, but I want to go back uh, Wednesday night, if you weren't here, we talked about uh, talking about the tithe and we we're talking about you got to give to God first, how God wants us to give to him first. And I talked about two principles, the principle of putting God first and the principle of faith. Those two things right there, those really, and you heard Pastor say, will crank God's tractor. And we talked about, well, can you actually tithe, but then you're not tithing biblically? Sounds like a sort of a trick question, but you know, you can tithe and not give the way the Bible says give. Because you can pay all your bills, and then whatever you got left over, well, it, this week it happened to be 10% left over, so that's what I'm going to give God. Well, you know, that's not the biblically way, the tithe, because you're not giving out of the principle of faith. God wants you to give him first, and then that will that, that tent that you give, that will bless the rest of it, and there'll be enough. God wants to bless you and I. Uh, you know, we want to live that happy life. I talk about that all the time. One of the definitions of blessed is happy. We want to live that happy life, and as Pastor said, you know, God wants you, he wants you healthy and wealthy. He wants you prosperous in every area of your life because it takes money to do ministry. To take God's word around the world, it's going to take somebody, and you know, God's going to find somebody to finance it. There's going to be somebody to finance it, but why can't it be you and I that do that? So the, the word first is very important to God. If you got your Bible, will you turn to the book of Exodus? And I just want to go back just a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, Bible college, uh, Pastor Gary's class is teaching uh, E.W. Kenyon books, The Bible in Light of Redemption. And we've been, pastors been preaching for years about redemption but you know you can understand the bible a lot better when you look at the bible in light of redemption so now i understand the old testament a lot better than i used to okay because now i look at the bible in the light of what jesus did amen so exodus chapter 12 i'm going to verse 3 it says tell all the congregation of israel on the 10th day of this month they shall take every man a lamb or a kid now that's not child kid that's a kid as in a uh, <laughs> and a little goat but um, or kid according to the size of the family of which he is the father a lamb or kid for each house verse 5 says your lamb or kid shall be without blemish a male of the first year you shall take it from the sheep or the goats now this is where God starts talking about first so I want you to understand does everybody understand and heard the principle that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? His, he never changes. His word never changes. So it's talking about first there. And if you go on and read that entire story, Exodus 12 and 13, which I encourage you to do, uh, read that and see exactly what it says. It actually goes on to say if that first is unclean, then you had to redeem it with something that was clean, a lamb that was clean. So... Then you, let's jump forward and go to the book of John, John 1, 29. And this is where the, John the Baptist was baptizing folks, and here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus up. And let's look and see what John said. He said, the next day John saw Jesus coming to him and said, Look, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, right there, John says, look, there comes Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. He's come to take the sin away from the world. You know what that is? What was Jesus? If you were here Wednesday night, you got a little head start. He was God's first. God sent him. 
God gave his first. If you wanted to go so far as to say God gave his tithe, but I'd venture to say Jesus was a lot more than a tenth. But God gave his first. See, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God's not going to tell you and I to do something that he's not already done. So Jesus came for you and I. You know why? Because Jesus was clean. Remember the sacrifice back in Exodus had to be clean. It was no different when Jesus came back. Jesus was clean and unblemished. You and I were not clean. Not because of anything that you and I did, but mankind, everything born after Adam, was born into sin. So we were unclean. So that one of us could not have been the sacrifice. It had to be a clean sacrifice. But see, that's how important the first is. Because Jesus, John 3, 16. God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And not only was his first, it was only begotten son for you and I. Of course, you and I are now, we're children of God. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ because of Jesus. So the word first is very important to God. And when you and I put God first, he blesses that. Now, you know, if then there's tithing and there's giving and we're talking about that. You know, and I sort of think, and of course, what I think doesn't really matter. But, you know, if everybody in the church tithed, if everybody gave the 10%, we would never have to worry about anything that God called us to do. We would have so much there available to do it. Nobody else would have to give over and above. But I sort of think this sort of like talks about giving in the Bible because apparently God probably knew there were some people that weren't going to tithe. You see, God wants to bless your tithe, but then sometimes we get mad at folks say, well, why did that person get blessed like this or why did this person bless more than me? They may just be a tither and a giver. Because once, you, once you're a tither, God says, I'm going to open the windows of heaven over your life and I'm going to rebuke the devourer. But once you get into the tithing and giving and you start tithing biblically, you start tithing off the first of your increase, not what's left over at the end of the week. Tithe off the first. When you do that, God's going to bless it. And then when people that give over and above, it's, he's going to, the blessings are just going to come and people are going to get mad. But that's okay. God wants every one of us blessed that way. That's why he teaches us the principle of the first, putting God first in every area of our life, not just finances. Put God first in every area of your life. What do we talk about when you first wake up every morning? What should you be doing? Better be talking to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. You put God first. And when you start, and people say, well, you're a preacher and you're up there just saying that. I guarantee you there's a lot of people in this room right now that put God first. Ask them. What happens when you start putting God first? How does, how does it help my family? How does it help my husband, my wife, my children, my, my work? So don't go to, go to work on Monday morning and say, well, first things first, I'm going to jump on this thing and get my week started right. No, our week started today. You get your week started right by being in church. You give your time to God. And then you put these principles to work in your life, and you just come back and you tell Pastor CJ or somebody, myself, and testify how good God is in your life when you start doing these things because it's going to happen you'll have a testimony it's a guarantee it's the only thing that's guaranteed it's guaranteed word from the father amen when we put him first he wants to bless us how many of you ready to give this morning let's say this confession together here at abiding love fellowship as we tithe and give we're believing the lord for jobs or better jobs raises and bonuses benefits Sales and commissions, settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, debts demolished, royalties received, wealth transfers, and, and partnerships. Let me tell you Romans 5.8. I, I don't want to stop without this. It says, in Romans 5.8, it says, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God gave Jesus by faith. Before you and I were believers, he gave Jesus. So there's your two principles. Principle of putting God first and the principle of faith. Right there. God did it. All he's asking is you and I to do it. Amen. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your, your, your grace, your mercy, your patience with us, Father. We thank you most of all for the word this morning. The word that we've heard from Pastor C.J. 
And then these words as they concern our finances. We know, Father God, as we put this word to work in our lives, there is a guarantee on these words. And, Father, those that have put this to work, they have testimonies. And I believe that everybody in this room, those listening by live stream, when they learn to live the life that you've called us to live, and we walk in the obedience of the word of God, that every single person within the sound of this voice will have a testimony. And it won't take a long time to get here, but there'll be testimony after testimony because we're just going to do simply what you've asked us to do. And we're going to walk in that obedience, and we're going to walk blessed. We're going to walk like we've never walked before with our heads held high. And, Father God, thank you for trusting us with the word this morning. We praise you for it. We glorify you, and we give you all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Weekly Sync, where we get you up to date on everything that's going on. Light Student Ministries is serving breakfast on Sunday, September 18th, after the 6 p.m. service at the Foley Campus. Come out and support our youth. Our Women's Prayer Ministry 2 or More meets every Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. at the Foley Campus. Leading with Integrity Leadership Conference will be on October 13th and 14th at 7 o'clock p.m. and on October 15th at 9 a.m. Don't miss this opportunity to grow in your leadership skills. Our annual Fall Fest will be at the Foley Campus on Saturday, October 22nd at 6 p.m. There will be games and fun for all ages. The month of October is Pastor Appreciation Month. We'll be honoring our pastors on Sunday, October 30th. Mark your giving or give online at abidinglovefoley.org. That's it for Weekly Sync. Stay up to date by checking in and following us on Facebook. place to be. It's just glorious. We serve a supernatural God. It's always an on-time word. Belief is a gift from God. Every one of us has the ability to receive it. There's so much joy here. It's a really good opportunity for you to meet other sisters in Christ. Right now, mark your schedule, get your babysitter lined up, because you will be changed. Glorious with Jesse and Kathy Duplantis, October 7th and 8th, 2016. Our mission isn't complicated. To win the lost, to connect people to the body of Christ, to train and equip them for the work of the ministry, to send them out into the world. the move of the Holy Spirit. This is our mission. This is C.J. McBride Ministries. You can help us by sowing into this ministry and becoming a partner. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of y'all going to focus on the Word this week? Man, praise God. I know it's working in every one of us. Bringing about God's perfect plan and His purpose. Praise God. I was going to share this real quickly. Uh, we went to the uh, Christian United for Israel uh, luncheon. Was that when was Thursday. it? Thursday. And uh, and so uh, I'd never met Pastor Lyndon uh, Allen from Tennessee, from the Nashville area. And uh, Pastor Gigi and I just spoke for a moment, and uh, he spoke. Man, it was just the Holy Spirit fell in that place. Anyway, long story short, when he sat down from talking, 
He said, man, I just love you. He said, I'm going to take you to Israel. So I'm going to Israel with him. March the 6th through such and such, and such a date, and it's only going to cost me $500. The word working. Amen. And then I uh, had uh, Anthony, uh, actually, you know this guy, Apostle Anthony Cox uh, from Mobile. Uh, just several weeks ago, he called me. He said, I don't really know you that well. He said, I met you at a, at a man's conference. He said, and uh, he said, but I, I'm a pastor. Uh, I passed away or something several years ago and he said every time I pray about having a pastor he said you come to mind so we met with him uh, Saturday and so he's going to come in and become a part of uh, uh, an extension of, of what we're doing to be able to be a blessing on his life and the amazing thing was he, he said you know what affected me so much when we met he said, I asked you, what, what has caused the most growth in your life? And he said, this was your reply. Somebody say, I take two to five minutes every day and pray with my wife. He said, and I started doing that. And he said, our church is running around 100 people now. And he said, I just did that one thing that you said, do how many know the word of work? If you'll work, Why? Because there God commanded the blessing. Matthew 18, would, come on. Somebody say, I'll be your two. I'll be your two. I have my I'll be your two shirt on. I, I'm going to put it on when I leave out of here. But I wore it this morning. And Pastor Patrick had sent me a message. And, uh, and so I just took a picture of that shirt. And I said, I'll be your two. Amen. Praise God. And so really the most powerful prayer you can have is with your spouse. Well, you get in agreement. And God commands the unity there. Amen. The word just really flourishes there. Praise God. All right. Let's stand up and say the blessing. And again, we appreciate you coming. Listen, next week, try to get somebody to come with you. Listen, this is this is going to be some basic teaching, but it's going to be so, so strong in people being able. I mean, if, if, we, if we can get this over the next time that we're preaching it, it it's going to change everything. And I believe that we're living in a, in a, in a favor in the church that the church hadn't seen in 50 years. I believe that. I believe there's an open, an open door of opportunity that has come to the church that we have not seen and experienced. And I, and I believe it's going to be the next 20 to 30 years. I'm so excited. Uh, Pastor Gerald and, and Mia ministered in Pensacola this morning and Praise preached God. a word over there. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I know a lot of ministers that do the live stream, and I don't have a problem with that. But, you know, we have a Bible college. And my, and my heart is not to live stream myself into other cities. My heart is to raise up pastors, come on, to go pastor local churches in local cities Amen. with the same spirit of faith mm -hmm. and have a greater outcome than I have. You know, that, that's, that's my heart's desire. You know, because I asked the Lord alone, you know, it's, it's been several uh, months ago, I asked the Lord, I said, you want me to stay or you want me to go? And he said, I'll bless you if you stay and I'll bless you if you go. But I will not bless you if you double-minded. Come on, so what does that mean? When your heart is in something, in other words, you can't be pumping Kool-Aid. Come on, you're, when your heart, you know, and the one thing I can't stand as a leader is somebody half-heartedly in something. I'd rather not even have it. If your heart is not in that, do me a favor. Don't do it for me. Because you're not doing it for God. If your heart was in it, you'd do it for God. And so don't do it just, well, I'm just doing this for pastor. No, 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 no. You serve as unto the Lord because I, I, I don't have no checkbook big enough to pay you for what you do. But he does. <laughs> See, he got it. When your heart's in it, God's got to pay you. That's what I was telling uh, uh, Apostle Cox. He said, he was asking me about going into ministry. I said, well, the first thing I learned was uh, I was in the military for a lifetime, and uh, payday ain't on the 1st and the 15th, <laughs> but there is a payday, amen, so you just got to stick with it, amen, so somebody say, my heart, my heart is in serving the Lord, serving everything I do, I do it as unto the Lord, amen, let's say this together, man, that's, is that crooked or is that just you can, me? You can, it's okay, you can still bless it, baby. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name.
Amen. I thought I'd snorted so much eternal life. That <laughs> hey, hey, listen. We did take Jeremiah to see the Pete's Dragon, and that was good. But our date, our, we went to see a matinee movie for our date time, and it was um, Hillsong. Hillsong's Hope Rising. It, it's a wonderful experience and it says in there that the, the <coughs> producers encourage you to participate we were the only ones in the theater and we were praising we were stand, i said let's stand we, up and worship the lord yeah, but you know the amazing thing when they did the album some of them like brian houston's son joel he the way they the way they did that he literally did not sleep for like three, three or weeks. four weeks yeah. he was awake just he said man come on god come on and he was but I mean, man, whenever, the, and, and the thing was, when they played that music, they had the music, but so much of the words, that was the first time they had ever sung the words together. And man, the Holy Ghost hit that Coliseum, and you could feel it in the theater. I could, man. I was like, whoo, I was up on my feet dancing and shouting, amen. Praise God. I said, well, that's just, just us. And so we took a picture and sent it to Pastor Jesse and Miss Kathy said, today we have our own theater. You know, because they have their own theater. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Good word this morning. Good word. A couple things uh, for tonight uh, besides it's a great time every time we have church Sunday night in the house of the Lord here. And the Holy Ghost shows up. Uh, and then immediately following that, we're also going to feed you not only of spirit, but we're going to feed you in the body. And uh, Pastor Eric has got uh, planned breakfast for you. He's got biscuits and gravy and pancakes and French toast and all the other trimmings and eggs and, and grits. So come hungry, eat a light lunch and enjoy it and, uh, and be blessed. If you're visiting us for the first time this morning, we pass, we'd like to meet with you just a few minutes. And Pastor would like to introduce himself and the staff. And so Miss Joanne's right out that door there. If you go and just go in our hospitality room and take two minutes and say hello to us and well, we want to bless you and thank you for coming this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you in the mighty, matchless, wonderful name of Jesus for this day, for this word, and for the chance to gather together as saints. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy that has brought us through this time through and to this day. Lord, as we grow up in you, as we come to encourage and exhort and admonish one another to love and good deeds, as we come, Father God, to let this seed take deep root in us because it does change our lives, and it changes our heart, and it will change our destiny. We thank you for the harvest of righteousness we all experience, and we thank you for your love and goodness that's been here present this day. And you, to you and to you alone, we give all the glory, honor, and praise. And God's people said, Amen.